I, uh, I read a stat this week um, about Christmas. Uh, it's, it's, it's from the National Retail Federation that uh, retail spending is down this year. Uh, uh, holiday retail is down by 1% from last year, just 1%. So we're only going to spend $437 billion in holiday retail this year. Um, the average American will spend $832 just for Christmas Day on decorations, food, and presents. $832. Meanwhile, on the planet, there are 3 billion people who make less than $2 a day. So those 3 billion people, if they work every single day of the year, they will make $732 full-time every day that 3 billion live on less than that. $730 working all year. We spend $832 on one day of stuff we don't need. It's crazy. But it becomes normal to us. We just go, well, that's, that, we live in America. That, that's what we do. You guys, I, I hope that we as believers take these things into account and live differently. That, that I, I, I was challenged a couple of years ago, um, actually by one of the professors at, at, at our college, um, as, as to some of my thinking on some of the things I think about, and we were talking about a certain issue, and he goes, well, how much of your beliefs are American and how much of your beliefs are biblical? Aren't they the same thing? <laughs> you know, I, I just, it, it was weird. I never really was challenged that way. I just thought, well, isn't this true? And isn't this true? And is this true? It was, and it was just a challenge. You know, wipe away, wipe away all of your culture and, your, you know, the baggage from how you grew up. Because we all have baggage, right? You know, depending on the home we grew up in. I mean, didn't we all grow up in messed up homes? Everyone grew up in a messed up home except for my kids. So, so you, you just, <laughs> no, I, I was thinking that too. I was thinking, man, I, I got a weird life and my kids have to kind of deal with that. But, but really, we all have these different upbringings and, and, and then our culture and just, just, just uh, and, and, and being uh, American and, and even growing up in different churches or religious backgrounds we grew up in, it's very easy to just get into a mode of thinking, well, this is normal, this is right, and we just go with it rather than separating ourselves from all of that as much as we can can and saying, God, let me just open up this book. What, what conclusions would I come up with if I just opened this book? If I just took all of my morality, all of my thoughts, my whole mindset was just clearly biblical. Not from my upbringing, not from my church upbringing, not from being American, not from whatever culture you come from. Just putting that all aside. I mean, this is the wrestle in life. I've had to do this over and over and go, well, I was always told this, I was always done it. You know, everyone tells me this, well, put it all aside. And that's why we talked about last week, get alone with this book. Get alone with this book. I've been talking about this for a while. Get alone with this book. Because you, you won't, until you do that and get alone with God, you don't realize how much you are influenced by other things. And so suddenly it makes sense to us to spend that amount of money on one day when half of the world is living off that amount for the whole year. It just, it's normal to us. But I'm saying, would it be that if we just had a biblical mindset, if you just started with Scripture a lot of this is on my mind because I talked to a buddy of mine, uh, and I've talked about him before. Um, John is a friend of mine from Northern California, and, uh, and he introduced our church to uh, Pastor Nayak from India. And if you remember, it was, it was a little over a year ago. Um, remember in, uh, in India in 2008, uh, in the Orissa area, they just had those crazy riots and, and they were just killing Christians. They would just go into cities and kill every Christian they could. They would burn down their homes and so now there's about 50,000, we talked about that, about 50,000 Christians uh, who are displaced 
because of their faith. The radical Hindus came and just burned down everything, and every time they try to rebuild a house, it gets burned down. So they're, they're just out in the, you know, in, in, the, in the jungles and whatever else. And we talked about that. Well, he just came back from another trip, and we were talking about it, and, and it was good because we were able to give some money, and, uh, and, and the foundation of the orphanage that we're building is, is there now. And he says, you know, by, by March, April, we should have a home. And, and he says, you need to know that, that all it should fit about 150 or so, which is a, a drop in the bucket, but the, the focus, uh, he says, is, uh, is most of the, the widows and the orphans are from pastors, because they'd go in the town, they'd kill the pastor first, of course, you know, or the missionaries, and, uh, and so he says, I'm just, I, the whole time I was there, he goes, he goes, I was talking to the widows, to the pastor's wives, and, and to the kids of these pastors, and they're the ones that are going to be housed in this place, and... Um, and, uh, you know, it hits close to home because I am a pastor and I think, wow, you know, that's, that's just nuts. That's my wife. That's my kids. And, you know, and, and the, the way he described it, he says, you know, he's talking to these widows and he didn't realize how bad the persecution was. He says in most homes, you know, they just came in just floods of people with machetes and they would just basically chop off the arms and legs of the pastors and so they would die pretty quickly. But he says in some places... You know, the widows, the, the wives were talking about how they tied their husbands to a tree and tortured them for three days, slowly breaking every bone. Um, it, it, it was, he says, it was so evil. It was, uh, you know, like we read about the Romans and how they devised crucifixion for Jesus. They thought, okay, what's the most painful way and the way they would torture people? It's like, we, we don't want them just to die. We want to torture them. We want it to be a slow death. We want it to be a picture to everyone else. It's that same type of mentality that's going on in certain parts of India right now with the, the, the Hindus that are saying, look, just convert back to Hinduism. Get away from Christianity. Just deny Jesus Christ and none of this will happen to you. It's meant to be a public display to scare these people uh, away from Jesus. And uh, so here are the, the men who died for this who says, you know what, I'm not backing down. And here are their families that are left behind. And, uh, you know, as he was describing this to me, you know, I was just a wreck. I'm just, you know, I'm waking up in the middle of the night. I'm up at three in the morning just praying for these families because I, I just forget, you know, and, and you go out and buy, you know, some, some more clothes or whatever else, you know, you just, and, uh, and understand something. Man, I, I get... I get so sad about that, but then there's this other side of me that gets so fired up with a desire, a desire to help. Like, like everything in me starts, my mind just goes immediately like, wait a second, let me just think purely biblically right now, which, which is, it's, I didn't even have to work at it, you know, in this case. I mean, my heart just directly went to, wait, the way I understand it, if here's a widow and her kids and her husband died for the sake of the gospel and they watched their dad suffer for the Lord, then I need to be thinking about them far more than I think about myself. And, and it's not about giving them my leftovers. I started thinking, wait a second, they deserve a home more than I deserve a home. And my mind starts going, wait, maybe I need to sell my home. Is there a cheaper way to live out here so that I can care for them? And it's not a guilt thing. It's not like, oh, this is what I ought to do, and this is what I have to do as a Christian. No, everything in my heart just goes, I would love to live for that. Like, it gives me a, a purpose to live. Like, I, I'm gonna live for their sake. I wanna, I wanna make their cause known. Um, I get excited about coming and bringing it before you. Remember when, I, remember when I came back from Uganda with Dave Phillips and Children's Hunger Fund a few years ago, you know, and I, I, and I, I told you about that, that, that jungle I was in and these kids and I was just going nuts. And, but it wasn't like this bum, it was a bummer, it was a sad thing, but there's also this desire in me as a believer that goes, man, I wanna, I wanna do something for them. I wanna, you know, and then to go back and see these orphanages and see these, these schools that we build and see these kids in uniform and dressed up and you, you just go, man, what a great thing to live for. Look what happened there. And so when I hear this situation in India, everything in me just goes, okay, I wanna do this, I wanna do this. What do I, I, I want to sacrifice, I want to, I, I want to lay down my life for these people because, and the thing is, is, is they're, they're not even asking for any money. 
They didn't ask for money for this orphanage. You know, I'm hearing about it. I'm like, is there anything we can do? And, and here's their response. Just pray. Just pray for us because we pray for you. I get emails from India from these orphans that, that, that tell me that they're praying for me and for Cornerstone Church in Simi Valley. Think about this, widows and orphans in India who've been persecuted around the jungle, some are in refugee camps, they are praying for us here in Simi Valley, Cornerstone, specifically Simi Valley. That is one of the most humbling things to me, like, are you kidding me right now? I don't need your prayers. You know, you almost feel like that, don't you? Like, you know what, let me pray. And the truth is, is they probably pray for me more than I pray for them, and that disgusts me. I just go, how can, how can this be? How can they have this desire for prayer? And, and Okay, but here's the thing. Okay, and, and I read this article, and before my buddy went out to India, I go, okay, you've got to substantiate this because this is almost hard to believe. It is hard to believe. I believe it. I believe God could do it, but I'm reading this, this, this article. I'm going, come on, Really? And so he went out there, he says he interviewed 18, 19 different people on this issue, and he goes, it's common knowledge out there. Okay, here's the story. This year, what's been happening, according to this article um, by, uh, I'm trying to think of the name, Restoration India, something like that, Mission Restoration India. They're talking about some of these places where uh, these, the area where the Christians were persecuted the worst, that lately there have been these herds of wild elephants that have, this is a very strange thing even there, and they have come to certain cities, the cities where the fiercest persecutors were, and they would just come into the city. They said like these little baby elephants would come in and they would leave. And these big elephants would come in and they would just trample over certain homes. And they were the specific homes of those persecutors. And they talk about these other instances where people are coming to persecute the Christians and then these elephants show up in these towns and drive these people out and trample over them. And I'm reading this going... Gosh, that feels biblical, you know? It feels like, like, but it's just, you know, I'm very skeptical of things. I'm like, come on, really? Go, go ask people, is this, is this real or is this just someone trying to, and he, they, they swear by it. They go, no, in, their, in that area, they literally have labeled these elephants the Christian elephants. <laughs> you know, seriously, they, like, they say, that's what, but, but it's, you know, as I, I read that, I'm like, but I, ha I don't see things like that. I don't experience things like that. At the same time, I got to go, well, I haven't been persecuted like that, and I don't believe in prayer like they do. They believe in prayer so much that they're spending their time praying for us in Simi Valley. And, uh, and so when I read those, it's, part of me is like, what, really? And the other side is, well, it makes sense biblically. If I get out of my normal mindset and think biblically, I go, well, why couldn't God do that? And why am I doubting these things? But, but the thing is, 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 like I said, they're not asking for money. It's just my heart to give it. I want to. Like, it would kill me not to be able to build a house for these families. And, um, and so to me, it, 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 it seems, from what I understand, and I was asking uh, that my, my buddy that's over there, I go, it seems like they more just want to know that we care like their brothers in America care and would actually take the time to pray for them and think about them. And so in my mind, I think, yeah, let's definitely pray for them, but also what a, what a great way to show them that we care, that they could have some monuments out there to see, no, 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 I want to show you my love through my prayers, but also through my sacrifice and say, look, here, you're more important than me. Um, let me take care of your needs and I'll sacrifice what I need to. Like, I, I hope that it never sounds like a guilt thing to you um, because it really isn't in my life. I, I mean, if, if you give nothing, I go, I'll, I'll figure it out, I'll figure out a way because I want to. I mean, isn't there something in you as a believer that desires that, that wants that? And, um, 
it's, it's no secret this year financially we've we've been doing really bad as a church first time in history but I know with the economy and then various reasons um, we've had to cut a lot we've uh, we've let go of several staff members um, and then we've also had to uh, start cutting missionaries and uh, and those are difficult difficult calls to make I had to make one this week and just go Merry Christmas but uh, our our, our money situation's been down, and the thing is, is, is we stopped passing the basket around because I didn't want it to be a guilt thing. I didn't want you to go, oh, there's the basket. I should throw a couple bucks in, because biblically, the Bible says that God doesn't need that from you. It should be those of us who have a desire. See, I, I look at India, and I look at those things, and I go, man, everything in me wants to be uh, a picture of Christ where I don't want to just give my leftovers. I want to I want to sacrifice. I want to give something up myself for their sake because that's just the desire that God puts in our hearts as believers. It doesn't feel okay to just throw a couple bucks in. It, it has to be our desire. And so while we've had to cut these different things, I got to say, I hear about situations like this and I go, okay, you guys, we got to we got to do something. Um, we got to up the giving, not not, uh, I'm glad we cut, I'm glad we streamlined, I'm glad we're, we're down to the bare bones and, and whatever else, and maybe God wants us to cut more, but I just hate when we can't give to things like this. Um, because here's one other thought, and then I'll, I'll get on to the passage. Um, these people in India I mean, you remember in grade school or high school when you learned about the caste system? You know, you had the Brahmins, you had the whatever, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then you've got the lowest caste there in India. Um, they're not even a part of the caste system because they're so low, and they're called the untouchables. Um, and so in the Hindu mindset, the idea is, well, they were born in that lower caste system. They're reincarnated at such a low level um, and so basically, a, a lot of, you know how a lot of countries will give missionaries support and the countries welcome it. But in a lot of places in India, they actually despise it because they look at the poor and they say, well, they're getting what they deserve. And if they live a good life, they can be reincarnated into a you know, higher caste system. And here we are at the top, the top 10%, the Brahmins, you know, who even believe, well, if they would wash our feet and drink the water, they can have their sins forgiven. You know, it's, it's that type of attitude um, because you're born into a different caste system based upon what you did in your previous life. And so they're looking at them and saying they don't deserve hospitals, they don't deserve schools, they don't deserve these missionaries coming and feeding them and giving them their necessities. And we're not talking about a small group of people. We're talking about that, that, that lower class system, um, about 300 million people. Okay, roughly the size of America are in that untouchable class where these people are. And then you become a Christian, and so there's not even a class for you. So you understand this, these, these people are dirt, and I just think it's something so good when the body of Christ in America says, no, we're going to stand with you, and we don't think you're dirt. Uh, we don't call you the untouchables. We call you brother. We call you sister. In fact, we'll lay down our stuff for your sake because we love you. And that's what Jesus did for us. He didn't look us at us as a bunch of gross sinners that were untouchable. He says, no, I'll come down. I'll lay down my life for you. And when we think about Christmas and we think about what it's all about, that's a picture I want to paint. That's a person I want to be. And, and, and here's, in dovetailing this into my, my message, most of us grew up in a culture where the majority want to teach that, well, really, we all believe in the same God. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's all the same God. We just, you guys, that, that doesn't make any sense. When you have opposing views, it can't be coming from the same God. If one philosophy teaches that, you know what, if you're in that lower class, if you're poor, you're crippled, you deserve it. And another system teaches, no, if there are people that are living in poverty and are crippled and are the least of these, then it's your, it's your responsibility to lower yourself, humble yourself, and give up your glorious position and go and be where they are. 
This whole idea of we all believe the same thing when you have you know, one religion that teaches that Jesus is the son of God that died on the cross for all of your sins and another one that says, no, Jesus is not the son of God. You got a problem here. You know, if one says he's God and one says he's a liar, that can't be coming from the same God. The Bible is so clear, it says that there is truth. I mean, if I feel like, I could be wrong, but it feels like it was in my lifetime that this idea of relativism really took off again. Because when I was a kid, I didn't see that. There was truth and there was, there was true and false. We used to do these tests, true and false. T or F, and you could kind of fake it and put one in between and hope, you know, no, it was an F, you know, but whatever. But it was the whole, there was a truth, there are things that are true and there are things that were false. And as time went on, it was weird. I kind of watched people just go, no, in certain things there is no true or false. Everything's true depending on your perspective. And what's true to you is truly true. And that never made sense to me. No, if one person says he's God and one person he says he's a liar, only one of them can be right. And that's, that's, you know, that's exactly what the Bible teaches. He says there'll be true prophets and there'll be false prophets. And, and in 2 Peter chapter 2, in, in verse 1, he says false prophets also arose among the people. And he says, just as there will be false teachers among you who will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they'll exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Okay, he says here, but there, there's false prophets. False prophets have always been. Here's 2,000 years ago, false prophets, okay? Not every religion is true. Not every prophet is true. And not everything that comes out of the mouth of someone who calls himself a pastor is going to be true. There's truth and there, and there are lies. And But the thing I want you, I, the thing we gotta get through our heads though, okay, false prophets arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Okay, the key word that I want you to look at is secretly. There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Heresies. We must change our idea of what a false teacher looks like. We have to change this mindset that all oh, will be obvious. Who's, who's, who's the false teacher, you know? It's, it's those who, who worship Satan, you know? And they got the satanic Bible out, you know? And they got skulls all, you know, all over their face. It'll be obvious. No, no, what's he saying? He goes, no, there's false teachers inside of this church. And he goes, they're gonna secretly, secretly, Jude 4 says, they crept in unnoticed. I could be a false teacher. And what's sad is, I get a bunch of you to follow me. You could be sitting next to a false teacher. It's not going to be obvious. They secretly bring this in. They, 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 they secretly, they, they creep in unnoticed. They're in there. I, I love what uh, Frank Mastelonardo said a couple weeks ago um, when he said the road to hell is marked heaven. <laughs> that was such a great statement. You know, my, my kids, my, my little ones have been watching this video of Tom and Jerry. <laughs> Remember them? I used to watch them as a kid and it was like, wow, all these memories. But it was some Tom and Jerry movie where they're, they're in this great race, Tom and Jerry and some bad guy and some old lady and they're racing around the world and maybe you've seen it. But um, 
you know, there's this sign that says, you know, race path, and you know, one way, and then quicksand the other way, and so Tom, you know, clever Tom, he flips them around, you know, and the race is this way, and the quicksand's over there, so everyone goes to the race path and ends up in quicksand. You know, it's, it's just that whole twisting, and I, and I thought of that when Frank was saying, you know, you got to understand, here's, here's the road, the path, the Bible says, which is wide, he says that the path of destruction is wide and many are going to enter through it. And the road to heaven is going to be narrow. But what are we taught? We're taught the road to heaven is wide. Everyone goes to heaven. You ever been to a funeral where the guy didn't go to heaven? <laughs> you know, according to the guy up front anyways. It's just, no, everyone goes. So you just wonder if someone didn't twist that sign around. Because this path... It's, it's this idea, they secretly bring it in. See, I, I don't think it's going to be so obvious. I know it's not going to be so obvious. The Bible tells me. Um, some of you in this room are false teachers. You give counsel to your friends, not based upon Scripture, but based upon the teachings that you were brought up with. And uh, you start going, well, you know what? God's not going to care if you do this, if you do that. You're not thinking biblically. You're just going with your mindset. Yeah, you can, you can leave your wife. I mean, if my wife acted that way, I'd leave her too. But you'll come to church and you look like the rest of us and everything else. And you... it's, it's, just, it's just crazy some of the advice I hear people give each other. Oh, it's no big deal if you guys love each other, you know, to live together or to mess around, to go to this point. Oh, you can watch that movie. I mean, come on. It's, it's, it's not like porn, so that, that's okay. And Did you get that from the Bible or are you just teaching people stuff that you think in your opinion? And, and, and the thing is, is, it says that they'll secretly bring in destructive heresies, destructive heresies destructive, that the word for destructive is referring to an ultimate destruction. It's talking about hell. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not this little thing that's it's not going to hurt you. It's a heresy that will, will ultimately lead you to hell. And they're going to be nice people, and they're going to be in the churches, and they're going to secretly come in and creep in unnoticed. And, and it says, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon them swift destruction. It says it'll get so bad they'll even deny the master who bought them. You know, let me, let me back up a little bit. Um, this idea of this false teacher, the reason why I say let's, let's beware of it is because biblically the Bible says they come in unnoticed and it also says that they disguise themselves as angels of light. If you look at 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11... 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. For no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So he says, okay, think about this. He goes, Satan, what do you think of when you think of Satan? Red, right? Tail, horns, what else? Pitchfork. It's just, just this ugly, monstrous thing. What does scripture say about Satan? Angel of light. Beautiful. Okay, let's go with scripture. Let's forget the cartoons we looked at growing. Again, here's this thing we grew up with. But let's look, let's think biblically. Biblically, Angel of light, think angel of light, that's the one that's going to take me down. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Who's going to bring in the destructive heresy? Someone who is disguised as a servant of righteousness. Someone who is, is, is an angel of light. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Quit thinking that these false teachers are going to just look and, and, and be so obviously evil. Galatians 1, Galatians 1, 8, 9, 
But if, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I will say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Okay, what's, what's, what's Paul saying here? He goes, he goes I, even if I contradict myself, and teach you something different from here on out. He goes, he goes, even if an angel, a beautiful angel out of the sky comes down and, and you know, tells you this gospel and tells you, no, here's another gospel of Jesus Christ, he says, don't believe it. Let that person be accursed. Because it's not going to be some wicked, nasty-looking person that's going to come up and drag you away. It's going to be some clean-cut, good-looking person that, that you know, just seems to live a righteous life and then teaches you a gospel that's contrary from what the apostles taught. That's a person that's going to knock on your door. And that's a person that's going to lead you in a different direction. Make, make, make no, just don't, don't get deceived by this. Look at the scriptures. That's why he says, we've got to know the, the gospel. That's why I'm going, open up this book, study this book, because it disgusts me how many of you I could lead astray if I wanted to. Why? Because you don't know this book. Man, I'm going to do my best, but how do you know I'm telling the truth right now? I didn't know I'm not that. That's why I'm going, man. One of my goals this next year, 2010, one of the things I want is one of my desires is to equip everyone, like everyone, every single person that can read, you know, that comes to Cornerstone. I want to equip you to study this for yourself, to know this for yourself. You know, kind of like I was talking about last week about Peter at the end of his life, kind of going, man, I just want to make sure you, you know this for yourself. You can recall the truth. You can know the gospel We've got, to, we've got to put the effort into these things. But going back to our, our verse, it says uh, back in Second Peter that they're going to bring these destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. See, that's the ultimate heresy, is when you deny the master who bought you. The master who bought you, the one who purchased you, instead they're going to teach you that you have to work your way to heaven rather than someone else paying the way for you. See, and again, here's a very American mindset is, well, you know, they're good people. You know, they're just telling you to do good things and the world needs us to do more good things and honor. So, so it looks so beautiful. Oh yeah, you know, just give, just love, just this, just that. He goes, at the same time, if you're gonna deny that you were bought with a price, that you were bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that's a destructive heresy. And I know for some of you that's hard to register. You go, wait, but they told me to do good works. They're, they're asking me to do good things. How could an evil person tell me to do good things? Because those good works are based upon your own pride so you can earn your own way to heaven. And he says, that's, that's a destructive heresy. The, the worst of it is when you even deny the master who bought them. It, it says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You were bought. You understand that? That's the idea of the, 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 the death of Christ was we were purchased. First Peter talks about that, um, how, how we were purchased. We were ransomed by him. And so anyone that tells you that that's not enough or that's not good enough, no matter how many nice things they say, you gotta go, no, 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 I was purchased by his blood. But also understand what it means to be bought with a price is you were bought, you were purchased. So, so therefore, it's like when we talk about baptism, you, you died to your old self, you were, you, you, you're owned by someone else when you're purchased. Back then they could understand it better because they understood the idea of slavery and someone owning someone else. The idea is we were bought by Jesus Christ. We were purchased by him, he owns me now. Do you live like you were purchased by someone else? That your body doesn't belong to yourself, that it belongs to Jesus. And so I wake up and I go, okay, Jesus, what do you want me to do with this body today? What do you want me to say with this body that you own? And the old Francis should have no say in what I do with this thing. It should be Jesus, it's his ownership. I bought Jim's car 
couple weeks ago. A worship leader got a good deal on it. So I bought it from him. So I got the pink slip. It's my car. He can't come up to me now and go, you were driving it too fast today. Or you're driving it too slow. Or you're doing this. Or why did you paint it purple? Or what, whatever. You know, why, why this? Why? It's like, shut up. It's not yours. I bought it. I, I purchased it from you. You can't tell me what to do with it. It's mine now. And, and you understand that's the, the mindset we should have with our own bodies. Like, the old me, I could just do whatever felt good, whatever I wanted to do, but then Jesus bought me. He purchased me with his blood. He saved me with his blood, and now he owns me. And, and the old Francis would still want to take control of this body. Well, here's what I want to do. Well, that's not really for you anymore. Remember, you gave up your rights to Christ. That's why, why Paul calls himself a bond servant. It was, I'm a servant by choice. I've chosen to put myself under him. He purchased me. We gotta have that mindset. But, but here's the thing I want you to notice about uh, the, the second Peter passage. Sorry if you could throw it back on there. Um, many, okay, so, so even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon them swift destruction, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with their false words. Here's what I want you to notice. What's the cause of this false doctrine? Is it because they were seeking truth and they go, wait, the more I studied, the more I realized this is what's true. No, that's not, that's not what happened here. It says that they'll follow their sensuality. You see, this is how our theology often changes. I've seen it with people in the church. Their theology changes when they fall in love. Their theology changes when suddenly they have this sexual urge in another direction. Then they start going to scripture and going, well, I, I, gotta, I want that so badly, and you know what, this verse says this, so, so that's fine. That's when it starts changing. Be careful, a lot of times our, our desires go a certain direction, then our theology follows those desires. And that's why we gotta come before God and say, God, I have all these desires, you gotta get rid of them. I wanna know what does this book say? Even if I hate it, you're my master and I know it's gonna be the best for me in the end, so what does it say? See, these people, they, they, they follow their sensuality and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And then what else? And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. What's this exploita exploitation of these people? Why? Is, is it because they found these truths in scripture? No. It's because they had this greed in them, so they came up with a philosophy and a type of teaching that would appeal to their greed and take their money from the other people, and, and they can justify it biblically. Same with the sensuality. It's like, what, are you pursuing truth, or are you just defending what you want to do? You know, I, I, get, I get hundreds of emails every week, and if I answered them, I'd get thousands, um, but I do try to read them all. Uh, because if I answer, then I get those people answering me back, and plus the new few hundred every week, and, and my life would be more chaotic. But I try to read them. I try to read every one, every single email I get. Um, and every once in a while, one hits me, and I go, I gotta respond to this person. I gotta respond to this one. Even though I already sent the form letter, I, it's just, I got to. I, and, uh, and this was one of those, it wasn't, you know, and it, and it went so well with what I said, and it's just such a, it seemed like such a pure-hearted person, so I had to just say something back. But it, it said this, Pastor Francis, I made a covenant promise to a ministry, she names it, but I won't name it, in, in January for $100 a month, it's a TV ministry. I'm a single mom with two teenage sons, one of which is mildly autistic with mild traumatic brain surgery. I work really hard to make ends meet, support my boys by myself. I have no family to help me, and lately the ends haven't been meeting to pay those bills, but still give my $100 covenant each month to the people. I was watching something about the $2.5 million paycheck that he gives himself annually and even more for each member of his family that works within the ministry, and saw pictures of his home and cars, etc., and I felt like someone punched me in the stomach. I know I give to God with a genuine heart and that what the pastor chooses to do with that money is between him and God, 
and he'll be judged if he misuses it. But am I wrong to be disappointed and hurt that my money I work so hard for to spread the word and feed poor people goes into his pocket for beautiful homes and planes and luxury dinners for him and his family? Here's my question. Am I wrong to break my covenant and give to a ministry I feel is working solely for the kingdom of God and not for personal gain while spreading the gospel? And I, you know, I, I don't know why. I mean, I, I get heartbreaking emails every day, but that one I just thought, ah, that just, well, what do you say? But, but she made a promise to God, and we walked through Ecclesiastes together. I, I just kind of sent those verses to her. I go, man, you can't make a vow before God and break it at the same time. You know, here's some other principles to consider, but I don't even know what to tell you. Here's some different thoughts, but whatever, that's all secondary. First of all, I just want to, Praise God for your heart, that you're, you want to honor whatever covenant you made to him, and that you just want to see things happen, even though you're in a difficult situation. In their greed, they will exploit you. You know, I just got a couple minutes left, but I got I to gotta hit this next part. Because um, this is the biggest lie that I believe is being spread. I'm just trying, I'm not looking for... I'm not texting. I'm just trying to figure out what time it is. There's no <laughs> clock up here. Okay. Um, I didn't have a, I was just checking the time. Okay. Um, I did have a couple texts waiting, and now that's in my head. But uh, I, I got to, I got to, I got to, ah, oh, man, what am I going to do? It's 10.04. Okay. We only have one more song at the end, so okay, I got to nail this. Okay. Uh, okay. I'll go faster next service, but what do you care? Okay. Verse, verse four. <laughs> um, okay. For if God, I'll, I'll just do these, okay? I wasn't going to go to 10, we'll just do these. For if God did not spare angels when they, okay, wait, 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 wait. Okay, here's the biggest, here's the, here's, okay, before I go that, this is, okay. Here's the biggest lie that's being spread. I said that, right? Did I say the lie? Oh, okay, I didn't think so. Okay, that's where I started texting. Okay, here's the biggest lie that I believe is on the earth that has crept in and, and is spread everywhere across America and even churches. Churches are changing their theology. New religions are brought up based upon this. And here it is. A loving God would not send people to hell. Where do you get that from? Because here's what scripture says. If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. And if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the, the, the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. You see, you see the case he's building here? He's going, okay, because this is, this is back then. Oh, come on, God's not going to do this. God's not going to do this. God's not going to do this. He goes, okay, let's, let's just back up. Let's just look at history for a little bit here. He goes, if God took angels... Okay, angels, angels have fallen. And, and right now, he says, right now, as you guys sit here in this room, somewhere, there's a place where those angels who sin, those angels who rebelled, and we don't have time to get into it, but those angels, they right now are chained up in hell. And they're awaiting judgment, which is even gonna be a greater hell for them. Okay, so you know God did that with the angels, and you remember the time when he looked at the world and saw the whole world as so, so disgusting that he says it, it grieved him in his heart that he even made them so he killed everyone on the planet? Here's his track record, guys. And then you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember Sodom and Gomorrah where there's a city that was so wicked and he couldn't even find 100 righteous, he couldn't find 50, he couldn't find 20. He had this one man, Lot. You know, Lot and his wife escaped, but his wife didn't even make it. And, and he says that he destroyed those cities, condemned them to extinction, making them an example. Okay, not that that was some weird thing in history. He made them an example. So you're going to bet everything on your friends who tell you if there's a loving God, he can't punish. 
We've got this weird understanding that if, if, if it's the popular view, it's the right view. And so you're going to bank everything. Oh, but my friend, but my parents, but, but these guys, but man, Oprah, but you know, all these people are telling me there's no way that he could send a loving, you know, loving God can't do that. And I'm going, well, I'm going to bet on the loving God that casts those angels into hell. Oh, wow. You remember last week we talked about uh, Isaiah 66, 2, and, and God's going to look to him who trembles at my word, who trembles at my word. This would be an appropriate time to tremble. Here are these angels, the high angels, the beautiful angels that rebelled against God, and look what happened to them. Here is a whole planet full of millions of people that rebelled against him. And, he, 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 and that's what he did to them. Here is a whole city that he says, I'm going to make that, this an example so that everyone knows. See, I, I tremble at that and go, okay, I'm not going to go with what the world says. Uh, I'm just not. And I might be the only one. I'm, I might be like Lot. I, I might, you know what? Real quickly, seventh, go, go ahead and go to the next one. Um, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. You know what? There's this picture of Lot Lot was alone, remember? Sodom and Gomorrah, that's when God sent those, there were those angels that came down and then the men of the city starts pounding on Lot's door going, we want to have sex with these angels. It's just a perversion of this defiling passion which that goes back to the days of the Noah and those angels that, that came down and, and the same thing, that's what he's referring to, those angels in the days of Noah. If you read 1 Peter 3, it talks, it explains that those are the ones that are down in this, this hellish place right now and changed in darkness. It's all about sexual perversion. It's all about, well, I should have the freedom to express myself sexually however I want. And they just keep going down these paths. I don't care who it's with. I, I should just be able to, to execute whatever I want, whatever brings me pleasure. And he says, well, you know, but then there was Lot. Lot was greatly distressed by the conduct of the wicked. He goes, he lived among them and he was tormenting his righteous soul. You ever feel like that? Where you feel like you're alone, you're looking around going, man, this is, this is all crap. Why are you guys all going this direction? This is killing me. This isn't what God wants. You know, maybe in your workplace, you're the only one going, man, oh, how could you all live this way? Maybe you're in your school and you're going, everyone in my school, every single person, and it's tormenting your soul and you're going, no, I'm not gonna live that way. I'm not gonna do that. Well, well good, you're in good company. Company. You're like Lot. Lot couldn't even convince his own family. He tried to get his kids. He tried to get his kids to go, come on, kids, let's go. Let's get out of the city. God's going to destroy it. This isn't the way we're going to live. We live by another, another world. There's another God. It's about him, not the God of this world. We got to get out of here. And his kids wouldn't even go. No one in the city would go. He finally convinces his wife, come on, honey, let's just go. You know, this is what God says. And as they're going, even the heart of his own wife is like, I miss that. And the moment she turned back, God struck her dead. And so Lot, tormented. Can you imagine just being alone in the city going, man, no one follows God except for me that's going nuts. And now these angels are coming down and the guys want to sleep with them. What, what, what am I living in? I'm just, I'm just sick of it all. And it says it was tormenting his righteous soul. I love that phrase. Ah, if you're right, your soul is righteous, then you hate a lot of the injustices on this earth. He goes, well, if, but he rescued Lot. He goes, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and how to keep the unrighteous under judgment till the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion. That means when you let your passion go with you and you start committing acts that you know are wrong, married, unmarried, whatever, it just it takes you down this road of defiling where, oh, no, I have a right to please myself physically. Isn't it crazy though, he says, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. They hate authority, that's another sign of these people. Wait, who in America doesn't hate authority? Whether it's our government, 
our parents, the elders of a church. I, 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 you know, let me just say something about the elders of Cornerstone Church. Let me say something about, you know, the false prophets and the greed and whatever else. You know, remember when Frank preached here a couple of weeks ago? You know why I trust Frank? Because I've known him for 20-something years. He's been preaching in the prisons for 20-something years, no pay. He'd work a 50-hour job, you know, and then Saturdays he'd drive down to Tijuana and serve in an orphanage, and then Sunday he'd go to the jails and preach to inmates. I go, it's probably the real thing. You know, I, I look at our elders and everything that they've been willing to sacrifice, some of them who could make a lot more money doing something else, and some of them who don't even get paid, and I go, you know what? And they're going to do everything they can to protect this church from this false teaching. And so I, I will say, I, I want to take this opportunity to say, I, I have a hard time with you when you bash any of the elders at Cornerstone Church, because I have never worked with a godlier group of men. Never. I have never worked with a godlier group of men. They might not be the most talented or best looking, I'll give you that. <laughs> but you, you talk about godly group of guys and you look at the motives behind everything. I, I, I try to check that out and one of the things we want to do this next year is they just really want to protect you and, and help you get into the word yourself. And, and we're scrambling trying to figure it out. We just don't feel like we've cared well enough and we're, we're trying to figure that out. And so to re reject that type of authority, at the same time, test everything we say and see if it isn't biblical. But, but let me just throw one last thought and then I'm done. I want to be extremely clear because I want you to know where I stand on things. And I want to stand before God and everyone watching this and everyone on this planet of where Francis Chan stands. I believe God can and will judge. I believe God Almighty has the right to punish as severely as he desires. That's his right as God. I believe in an eternal place of punishment, just as Jesus described in Scripture repeatedly, that it's an eternal place of punishment, hell. And I believe that anyone who thinks otherwise is wrong. I believe that I am right about this and that you would be wrong about that, because I do believe in truth and I do believe in error. And I recognize this is not the popular stance of the world, and I don't care. Because I look at history and I go, this is what God has done. And I believe there are angels in hell right now that dare to rebel against God's authority. And that's why they're chained up in that darkness. And I believe that other people are headed in that same place because they cared more about their own lust and desires and fulfillment of that than to subject themselves to a holy God. Now as I say that, there's a tremendous sadness in my heart I want to be bold enough to say that, but it, it kills me because I know that there are false teachers in this room that as we leave this room, you'll go and tell other people, no, he's full of it, that's old-fashioned, that's whatever. And call it what you will. But God knows how to punish. He's shown that, and he knows how to rescue. And so as the world gets more and more into this teaching that I've observed over my life and it's gonna get worse and worse and worse, it's gonna be harder and harder to stand. But I have to trust that God gave Lot the power to stand so he knows how to rescue. And that he gave Noah the power to stand when no one on the earth would listen to him. And God's saying, look, I know how to rescue. Our God is mighty to save. He can save you, he can save me. And despite everything you were brought up in, everything you were taught, all the sin and crap that's been in your life for years, he can rescue you from that. And the Bible says, you know what? We've got to believe that you can be purchased with his blood. Yeah, you were a part of the system and all that junk in your life, but he bought you out of that. And, uh, and that's the picture of baptism, is you're done with that whole world and Jesus Christ will buy you, redeem you, ransom you out of that, wash you up and make you a new person and he is able to rescue you from this wicked soul. And that's what we celebrate and that's the rock that we stand on.
And so the worship team's gonna come up and then. If anyone would like to get baptized or, or needs prayer, um, there'll be people up here. But I, I just want to say, you know, I praise God because I know that, that many of you stand with me. And, uh, and I think life's going to get more difficult. And it's going to be harder to stand on these things. And, uh, and let's just let's stand on this thing together. Let's fight this thing together. Because um, I don't want to be like Lot you know, being the one guy running out of Simi Valley <laughs> or wherever it would be, you know, that your city is. I, I want to go, no, here's, here's a group, here's my family, we'll get in the ark together.